Sweet. All right, we're live. Dude, I didn't bring a – it's the first podcast in a while that I forgot a water. And we'll, we'll see what happens today. <laughs> I didn't bring – did you bring a beer with you today? No, I, 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 I have tea, actually. What's so, up? The dad mug. I was uh, drinking wine from about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock on. So I'm like, simmer down, cowboy. <laughs> 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 complete Italian party. Everybody's shouting, like shouting, not not yelling. Just shouting, I'm right here. Shouting, I'm one foot away. Just speak to me. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was a good time. Sad for sad reasons, but a good time. Yeah, my, again, so, my condolences to you guys and Amanda, of course, but you know, you get to talk fishing tonight, so it's got to make your day a lot better. So. It does, and she let me get out fishing on Saturday in the midst of all this and fish the derby. So, uh, I, have, yeah. I have a, I have a angel of a wife. So yeah, she, she brownie, points. Points for brownie points right now. Oh yeah, she's not listening, but. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Well, welcome back to another Sears Angler podcast, episode number one hundred and twenty-five. It's kind of like a milestone, right? Another quarter. Yeah. Today we're getting on Mr. Brian Schmidt, the Bassmaster Elite Series. We're going to talk to him about a whole bunch of different stuff. Pretty uh, pretty excited, looking forward to that. But before we get into it, dude, tell me about the river. You had another tournament. Seems like the fifth one in the past like two weeks. That you've been third, over. third one in four weeks. Um, it was a little bit more of a grind than I had the last two tournaments. Didn't catch as many fish, but the quality was up. Um, respectively the first one i fished with you we had 15 and i fished another one we had like 17 and change and then i um me and my partner brandon put 18 and a half in the boat this weekend and i was like man probably gonna have a good shot at first or second here based on previous river bags and then my buddy billy and kelly decided to drop 22 and a half on us and a six and a half kicker so yeah. i got booted down to third so <laughs> i mean i can't even be mad about that yeah. i lost lost by four pounds like <laughs> yeah. good grief insane well hey congrats on third so i mean 18 pounds in niagara river is pretty good it is for um mid-september that's a really good weight for the upper niagara yeah. three four five years ago any tournament you fished on the upper niagara and you had 18 and a half pounds you won so yeah. i don't know if it's a testament to the electronics getting better and the fishermen getting better or the fish are getting bigger yeah. so Maybe you mix them both. But uh, yeah. we want to say thank you to Douglas, again, for making the fabulous rods that we use. As always. And Queen Tackle and the Tunks and Jigs and Drop Shot Weights. And Bailey, you can take over from here. Yeah, we have uh, – of course, I want to shout out Amped Outdoors. I, like, again, uh, we're, we, we say it every time that we got this announcement coming up. But really, I mean, it, it's so exciting because I want to talk about it more, but we can't because we don't have everything set in stone yet but Work in just, progress no it's 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 coming soon that's all we can say about it but huge shots amped outdoors because they're making a huge effort in supporting us through that so that's pretty awesome but today's pretty special uh we have we're bringing on two new partners uh kind of one in the same but huge shout out to morgan marine up here on cuca lake in pen yan uh partnering with them and team hobie uh, tomorrow, I will be going to pick up my new Outback that I will be using for the fall, taken down to Lake Chickamauga for the Mass Nation kayak event down there. And then in December, I will be swapping that out for a brand new 2021 Pro Angler 12, which is going to be the, the rig for the 2021 season, which I'm pretty excited for. So huge shout out to my dude Ryan over at Morgan Marine. Uh, shout out to Morgan Marine and Hobie. Really looking forward to be working with them this season so it's uh it's pretty exciting for us pretty exciting for the show and uh looking forward to it man it's we have a we have a great support group without a doubt but man we've been we've been talking too long we gotta we gotta get to the the good yeah, stuff. we gotta get brian on here yeah, yeah. we told him four minutes and we're going on five yeah <laughs> i know we're, we're being terrible hosts right now he's sitting down in the queue make he's he's angry <laughs> well without further ado let's get brian on let's here come on Brian, what's going on, man? Hey, guys. Doing good, man. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Thanks on for this. waiting five minutes of us yeah. talking about our 
not nope. <laughs> I'm not so good weekends. <laughs> <laughs> so, but dude, before we get into uh, into everything, Brian, because we like we talked offline, we have a bunch of different stuff that we want to talk about today. But what we like to ask everybody when they get on the show is, you know, how did you get into bass fishing? What was that first catch like? Who got you into it? The whole nine yards. So I could go on and on for hours about this, you know, because when you have a passion like we all do with bass fishing, you know, you, you remember everything. But I was very fortunate as very young in age, uh, my family would always take a uh, vacation to Canada. And I actually had like a great, great grandfather built a cabin on a very rural lake in Ontario. And it was one of them lakes that you would pull up to the marina and then you would take a boat to the cabin. You know, there was no roads to the cabin, but the fishing was incredible. Awesome. And you know, from an early age, catching anything, you know, perch, uh, rock bass, smallmouth, largemouth. And it just involved that, you know, it evolved to, wow, those largemouth really jump. Those smallmouth really jump. And, you know, you start to really want to fish for those a little more. And then you get your first magazine and, you know, the first Bassmasters magazine or in fisherman magazine and you see all these articles about bass fishing and it just quickly became a passion and uh it graduated you know as you go to school you know i was, I was able to get a blow-up boat and i started like that at ponds and graduated to a john boat with a little electric motor and i would go to small lakes and i i just became really passionate about it, you know, just trying to learn everything I could about bass fishing in general. And uh, the, the main thing that really happened to me for tournaments was, I think I was about 18 years old and my wife, you know, which was my girlfriend at the time, we went to this fishing show and there was a flyer, you know, for an open team tournament on the Potomac River. And I called the number and you know here I am I got a John boat I don't have any live wells nothing like that and the gentleman that answered the phone it was he was a the president of a club a club was having a tournament and he was like hey man hold on just just slow down let's let's you know come to one of our meetings you know, you know learn about the club and what you need to have on your boat to be able to do these tournaments life life-saving equipment and stuff like that and I went to the club and went to two or three meetings and during this time I actually bought a very old bass boat for like two thousand dollars okay I put probably five thousand dollars into it to be able to operate it okay <laughs> and this, this is what happened I'm 18 years old I get this boat running and now I was voted in to fish my first club tournament I go fish my first club tournament, and I won it. <laughs> Done. Done. 18 years old. Now it's pure luck. Okay? It's pure <laughs> luck. But that's it. You're, you're a professional fisherman. That's all you're going to do. You know what I mean? And uh, I spent probably three years in that club getting my butt kicked every tournament after that. <laughs> there were so many guys in the club that were willing to – teach me and show me the ways and I was just a sponge just soaking it in you know learning as much as I could I would go fishing on snowy days windy days days we would never go nowadays I I went and that's all I did and just graduated further and further to where I am now but uh just fortunate in the in meeting the people I met and having the upbringing I had you know yeah no doubt that's awesome that's Everybody's got to have that link, right? <clears throat> you don't hear about too many people that are completely and entirely self-taught to where the point where they can start competing at a, an efficient and competitive level. So that's that's pretty cool. That's kind of how you got the link. You got the smoke and everything from the whole trail, and uh, you know, you the first tournament. I mean, the first tournament you ever in, you won, which is pretty sweet. 
I can kind of relate to that too. Like first tournament I competed in, dropped 21 pounds. We think we're all bad. We think we're amazing. Go to the next one and get completely destroyed. <laughs> and we're like, okay, there's probably a lot more to it than that. So <laughs> you can totally relate on, on that, but that's awesome. Oh, yeah. But, you know, so, when you're 18 and that happens to you, oh, you're – you're a big dog, you know, oh. <laughs> you're, you're, just, you're meant to be, you know, and, and I'll never forget driving home, like, you know, 200 bucks in my pocket. Oh boy. So. Bass pro. Here we come. Yes, sir. <laughs> Set the world on fire. It was probably like a 15 boat club derby. And <laughs> yeah. it's all, you know, like I just beat all of my idols and I've known them all for three months. <laughs> No doubt. So, so talk to us then, because obviously, you know, you spent a lot of time with FLW. You fished a bunch of tournaments there, and obviously now you're on the Elite Series. Uh, I know you fished some Open to get to the Elite. So, uh, you know, talk about, you know, what was the time like like prior to, let's say, you get you starting that club derby, and then until getting to the, uh, the Elites or the FLW? So, going from the club, it, it graduated to I started doing well in the club, you know, after a few years and, and, you know, started to do some state stuff, state level stuff and, and started doing well in that. And then you catch wind of, uh, you know, at the time, I think they're red man's BFL. Mm -hmm. Wow. You could win maybe four or $5,000 fishing. So I started to fish those and same scenario for everything. Like it took a little time, and then I started doing well. And um, I think I won one BFL or something like that or two. And then there was Everstarts or Costas at the time. Started fooling with those. And those were, I, w I would only do the ones that would come local, you know. I didn't travel. I tried to stay local and uh, started doing well in those. And, and it got to the point where, Quickly, it got to the point with the Costas that I had saved a decent amount of money up, you know, and and it's like, okay, do you want to just stay local and Potomac, Potomac, Upper Bay, or do you want to branch out? And I knew going, traveling, and doing the FLW tour, is, it's not cheap, and, and you need to have your finances right. Now, luckily, I had put a, enough money away through the Costas that I, try, I started doing that. And my first year on FLW tour, I tried to go fish everywhere like it was the Potomac. And my mindset is I'm going to win. I don't care about cashing a check. I don't care about points. I'm going to make them eat my chatterbait. I'm going to make them eat my swim jig. And I don't care what body of water it is. And that's, that was a learning curve the first year, okay? You cannot do that everywhere. <laughs> you know, you start to learn about a shaky head. You start to learn about, a, you know, little ways to get get a limit. You know, you can't always do – you can't always fish the way you want to fish. And after a year or so, I started gaining a little traction there. You know, I started making it to the cup, you know, which is a – I think a very good accomplishment when there's 170 or 180 anglers, you know, and only like 30 some guys from the tour would make it to the cup. And that was the goal every year. Let's make the cup and FLW tour suited my schedule. And what I mean by that was it was six events at the time and they would start very early in the year. And my means of making a living with the charter boat wouldn't start till April. And it's April through December. But January till April, we're knocking four or five tournaments out with FLW. So it was perfect. It was the perfect scenario. And, uh, you know, I would follow Bass Masters. I follow every kind of fishing because I'm, you know, I'm a fan of it. And it just, Bass Masters wasn't the, you know, it wasn't the schedule for me at the time. You know, I thought, man, I would have to miss a lot more work. You know, it just, it didn't fit. But I kept with FLW and I would fish open on the side or coasters on the side. And 
you know, I won a tour event, which was very satisfying to me. That was something I wanted to do. So I won on every level in FLW, which was very gratifying to me. And, um, you know, last year I decided to fish some the full trail to opens, which was the first time I ever did that. And the first couple went well. The third one went well. And I go into the fourth one. And, you know, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but it was like I really need to focus in on qualifying for the leads. I just want to have that option. That was the goal. We, we're going to worry about the rest later. I had, had my FLW qualification if I wanted it. I want my elite qualification if I can get it. So I was like second or third in points going into the final open. And, dude, I had a very good event on, on Oneida. And uh, not to dive into another subject, but I caught a fish, my fifth fish day two on my last cat with like two seconds to go. And it was like magical. It shouldn't have happened. And the high I got from that was on, it was unreal because I fished a long time. And you, you know, how many times you hear somebody say, man, I caught one on my last cast. Well, it's never happened. And it happened then. It was, and it was a very special fish. So I got my elite qualification. And then this, this winter, me and my wife sat down and, you know, I talked to the companies I'm with and everybody was like, we would love for you to go to the elites, you know, and the time was right with the industry and everything like that. And we jumped on with the elites and, you know, couldn't be, couldn't be in a better place. FLW was my home. I still have nothing but love for everybody there. I just fished a Toyota series on the Potomac and, um, it just, I'm very glad to be where I'm at right now. It's, uh, I feel like the exposure you can get on the elites, it, it, it's pretty special because there's only 80 some guys. You know, that's a big thing. And when you start to fish a tournament, you're doing decent, you know, you can get some coverage and stuff. And it, it, it's hard with 180 guys. You can't, you can't show 180 guys coverage, you know, it, it's just difficult. So, it's all good. I'm happy where I'm at, man. You know, we still got half a season pretty much to go fish. So excited about that. No doubt. Yeah. So my question for you, you know, obviously you've had a lot of experience and you look at your resume and you've, you've done very well. You see the Potomac and the Chesapeake on there. You've done well at Oneida and Champlain. So what would you say? Obviously I'm sure, you know, you're saying grass, but your strengths are, and then also, what adjustments do you think you need to make to be, say, more successful in other regions that you might travel to with the elite? So, I, I love grass, grass, grass. But to to make that, I don't know, a, a different realm, you know, uh, I, love, I like to swim stuff. If I could find a power fishing scenario, I'm, I'm a happy camper. You know, when it comes to grass i i feel like i, I could catch them so many different ways but if, if i could pick a way it would be swimming something if it's a chatterbait spinnerbait swim jig you know if i could find that that probably my strong suit just because i have so much confidence in it you know when you're confident in something you seem to generate a couple more bites okay now what adjustments do you think you need to make uh in other regions I, I need to make a lot of adjustments, to be honest with you. Um, you Don't get we into all? Some, you know, we get into some of these lakes, they're blueback herring lakes. You know, when you're dealing with a nomadic bait fish and a fish, a large mouth or spotted bass that just follows them everywhere. How do you determine where you're going to fish in the tournament? So these are the things that intrigue me. You know, you'll never learn that. But there's guys that live in that region that they're better at it than, you know, guys that aren't. So I want to learn that. I need to get better on any clear body water, you know, anywhere that doesn't have vegetation, you know, super deep, clear water. I need to get better at that. And it, what's strange is I think it's electronics, you know, using your electronics, which is strange because I do that every day on the charter boat. You know, we just look for fish with our electronics. 
but it's something about when I go bass fishing, I want to fish. You know, I I don't want to look. I need to get better at looking. No doubt. Yeah, that blue, the blueback herring, that that whole strategy is something that I've never fished, but has puzzled me as well. As you know, you're on them one day, but you look how nomadic they are. It's got to like mentally kind of almost destroy you, freak you out because you're like, okay, day one went well, I found them. Are they going to be there day two? Because if they're not, what's my game plan? Then that's like something that I've kind of thought about. It's it's got to be. Unless you grew up fishing them or you spent a lot of time fishing those bodies of water, it's got to be very mentally worrisome, I would say. No doubt. It, but It really is. It, it's it's so tough to, to pattern. You know, weather can change it. And I don't know all the variables, but they're here today, going tomorrow, man. They, they've heard a lot of really good fish from me. I'm sure. sure. No doubt. Uh, we have a question here in the comments, and it asks, because you brought up Chatterbait a few times, and uh, they ask, are you a glass rod or a graphite rod for Chatterbaits? Uh, I'm I'm a graphite graphite guy, yes, sir. Nice. Yep. Andy, I know you had a, a question that you were waiting to ask Brian here as well. I'm going to come back to it because I lost it for a second. I, I was <laughs> – I was kind of hoping he would actually say graphite because I know a lot of people uh, use glass or composite rods. So, what is your why do you why do you use a graphite rod over the above mentioned? Like, is it a feel deal? Because I know you can feel it with a glass rod, or is it more strength to get them to rip them out of the grass when they actually eat that chatterbait? Do you think two two prong approach? It's I'm accustomed to it. It's what I grew up doing. I'm comfortable with it. You know, I got a rod that I really like from Fitzgerald Rods. You know, it's a chatter, it's designed for chatterbait. Uh, it's actually a Brian Thrift Signature Series. And it just, to have that power, you know, if you're in Florida, you hook an eight pounder, you know, around some reeds and grass, you need something. You know, you, you don't want to feel vulnerable because of your rod. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember who put it. Someone had posted on their social media. I want to say, I can't remember. They were they were essentially talking about when it comes to equipment that the last thing you want to worry about at the end of the day is if your equipment's going to fail. You know, because the only thing you want to worry about at the end of the day is if you can put that fish in the boat. And if you do say you do fail, that it's on you, not because of your equipment. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a big way to thing. Put it big big deal you got to control everything you can control no doubt we have, we have another question here too from ray stickle i don't know if you can see that up on the screen but he asked what type of rod is the one you designed for swim jigs okay that's that's with fitzgerald rods it's a seven foot one um medium heavy fast action we we short we took two inches off of the butt of the rod and the reason behind this is I don't just throw my swim jig out and reel it in. Sometimes I'm popping it almost like a jerk bait. The, you know, having a little less action or a little less distance on your forearm helps you do that. Almost like a jerk bait rod. This rod has a very forgiving tip. You know, you want the fish to get the swim jig before you, you know, you set the hook and everything. This lets them get it. It's almost has like a crankbait tip on it to let them get it. But it has the backbone, you know, to get them out. I mean, you could fish my rod on braid or fluorocarbon. We kind of met the medium there when we designed this rod. Um, just, you know, you can need to get it in your hand and start throwing around a swim jig and you'll know what I mean. No doubt. That's pretty sweet. Any of you have you remembered your question yet for Brian? Yes. Okay. So we know that you are a Potomac Upper Chesapeake grass fishing hammer. What would you say is the major difference coming from a tidal grass fishery going to uh, not so much a Great Lakes but Champlain type grass fishery? What is the first thing you look to do different from place to place? To break Here, down the water and figure out what you're gonna do. This is this is simple simple strategy. 
when I'm on the Potomac in the upper bay, the problem is you could be around the mother load and they're not biting because of the tide. If it looks right up north and you don't get a bite, they're probably not there. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> up north, they're biting. So when you deal with grass, I don't care if it's tidal or not, you know, northern fisheries, southern fisheries, wherever you want to go, a lot of times the best looking habitat has them. I mean, bottom line, you know, if you look at an area that you're like, wow, this is a lot of grass, it looks healthy, has a lot of, you know, good things going for it, they're probably there, you know, but the tidal deal, that's, that's the trick, man. I mean, how many times, I don't know how many times I've sat on places for hours, man, and not got a bite, and then it, they fire for an hour, and it's over, you know. That's the only difference. But when I go up north, man, we're not giving it that much time. If they're not biting, we're going. Bye. You know? <laughs> yeah. So in a situation like that, when you say like in a tidal fishery where you know the fish are there, and the timing is right, and say you know they're firing off, but then it slows down. Now, when it slows down and those fish stop to bite, are you leaving them to find more active fish, or are you essentially breaking down your pattern and changing up to try to then trigger a couple more bites? There, there's so many different approaches I've seen where you cannot catch them unless it's the right tide. I mean, I've literally seen where you know it's all or nothing. The best scenario is on the Potomac or the Upper Bay tidal system, if you can have two spots, one for this tide and one for that tide. That's rare to find, but if you have that, that's that's golden. But there is times where you change your approach, you change your baits, you know, hey, they're eating top water on the low tide, you know, the grass was touching the surface, you could trick them on a frog or a buzzbait, now the tide's over the grass, okay, we're we're switching to flipping, or now now we can get a swim jig or a chatterbait over the grass. So there's times you could you could sit there and figure them out. But I, like man, I I won a uh, coastal on the Potomac a few years ago, off a spot that if you did not go there on the last couple hours of outgoing, you would never think of, thought a fish lived in this area. But if you were there when it happened, it was every cast. And it's amazing to me that I I caught that that many fish during this time, and I could not catch them on any other tide. Like there was a pile of them there, but they must have moved or something. I couldn't find them. I'm not sure what happened there. I apologize. I got dropped and loaded right back in. I was like, that was weird. Andy decided he didn't want to talk to us anymore. <laughs> That's funny. I, that, that's, that's good to know. It's it's definitely interesting when you when any like somebody like Andy and myself where we haven't really. I mean, obviously Andy has like the Niagara River, but a a tidal grass fishery is something we really don't have here. So it's and what, you know what, anything close to it is say like a one of our Finger Lakes with a strong wind. That's probably the only closest thing we do to have like for current. Um, so it's. It's definitely an interesting perspective for us to think about, and that's why we're so curious. But uh, it's definitely a cool little fishery. But uh, we have a question here in the comments and asks, what pound line do you prefer to use with your swim jig? I, I use 15 pound P line ultimate fluorocarbon exclusively on my swim jig. Um, I use that as well on my chatterbait. Unless I'm in Florida, the only time I change, I I put 40 pound braid on both in Florida, uh, just just because there's there's scenarios where that 15 is a little bit light, you know. But anywhere else in the country is 15 pound Florida. No doubt. Uh, you had, you spoke about the Chesapeake. Uh, one thing you mentioned offline and also in your social media, as people can see, is that you're a charter captain. So when did, when did that start? I mean, I want to I hear how uh, that originated. And then, you know, when do you usually take people out on, on charters like throughout the season? Like, is that an in-between sort of deal? And how does that work? So um, my wife 
actually got me the job years ago with her with her father. Um, when me and my wife started dating, one of our first dates, we went fishing, and I was shocked how good of a caster she was, you know, and she knew a lot about fishing. So I'm like, wait, hold on. How do you know all this about fishing? Well, my dad's a fisherman. He's a charter boat captain. And she introduced me to him. And he, at the time, and still does, I mean, he was a full, he is a full-time charter fisherman and had a big charter boat on the Chesapeake Bay. And he takes private trips out, you know, groups of families, business groups or whatever. And, you know, he's like, hey, you want to fill in one day as a mate? Hell yeah. You know, sign me up. So, I started as a mate, you know, a couple days a week, and it graduated to full time, you know. And he, he's very busy. I mean, he has a lot of, a lot of trips. And shortly into that relationship, he asked he asked me to get my captain's license, and uh, he wanted me to run the boat some days where he could take off. And I did that and started running his boat, and that went on for about ten years. And it's a full-time job. I mean, it's, you know, even during our down season, you're working on the boat, working on something related to the charter fishing. And uh, five years ago, I actually bought a charter boat myself, and it's all under my father-in-law's namesake. You know, he, he books the trips. You know, he keeps us going, and everything like that but we we're on the chesapeake bay uh we chase stripers a lot you know bluefish mackerel anything that comes around we're, we're fishing for them but stripers is probably our mainstay that's awesome so like for an average day like numbers wise size wise what's it usually like so a good time of year is in the in the summer you know like august we just have so many different species so let's say we might go get a limit of stripers pretty quick you know to a person we go catch some rock you know some blue fish some spanish mackerel you know maybe 70 80 fish days you know for for the clients and everything and some people don't even want to eat the fish they're they're, they're happy to just catch them and letting them go but uh i i get the experience tidal you know that the tide affects those fish as well out there, you know, and, and that keeps me sharp when it comes to tidal fishing because there's little tricks we do out there related to the tide as well. That's smart. I like that. So how do you adjust to like a TVA system? Like, is it kind of familiar to you or is that whole thing wholly entirely different? When I first started going to the TVA, some guys that I knew were like, you're going to do very well. It's current drift. You got to remember the fish on a TVA system want to live near that current. They they have learned to live off of that current. So me being a tidal guy, simple, right? Not so simple. So it's still a little tricky to me. Um, the way they set up, the way they generate the current, it's not always the same. So you might have the special afternoon of fishing. Well, if you look at your your power generating schedule, they were really rolling some current at that time. We'll go there in the morning and they're not moving any current. There's no fish there. So it's it's an interesting thing. It's a, it's a timing deal for sure. You know, unless they're spawning, that's a different scenario. Yeah. But other than the spawn, they're relating to that, that current. And, you know, it's taken me some time. I'm starting to get the knack of it. It, it is a very, very good, good all the TVA lakes are very good fisheries for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And do you have anything before we uh, move on to uh, another segment? Here, Brian? Well, as I say, with the TVA and everything, you've got to be looking forward to Gunnersville in a couple weeks. Oh, I, I really am, man. Um, I, I'm so excited to, to, to know that I'm going grass fishing. You know, period. I'm I'm gonna go. I don't care anything but grass on this lake. I don't I don't care if there's thirty pounds sitting out on a stump somewhere. I don't care. I'm gonna fish grass. And I'm gonna find them, and it's gonna be fun. Man, <laughs> I uh, I I respect the uh, 
the dedication to the craft of strict grass fishing. <laughs> and it's, Dog. it's a different mindset to go and fish grass all day. So I applaud you for that. And my theory is some of these guys are going to be overwhelmed. The amount of grass, you know, some people show up, they're like, the whole lake's grass. What do I do? And, and that's where I love that. You know, there is something that they are relating to. And I, I'm just looking forward to it, man. I've been there three times for three tour level, kind of tour level events. And um, I've had decent success there. I kind of look for Hopefully I'll find it this week, man. But either way, we're going to trust. We're going to trust our gut. And we're going to fish grass. And we're going to find them. That's all there is to do it. That's awesome. I think, at least for me, one of the biggest adjustments uh, growing up and learning grass is learning what grass is actually efficient grass, where you should just kind of skip on it and keep moving. And there's grass like a milfoil where you should actually slow down and try to pick it apart and learn to see if there's actually fish in the area because that will actually hold fish. It, so do you have any advice for people – who may not know grass fisheries or want to get better at grass fisheries and learning uh, just like kind of subtle tips here and there to, to know what to look for. So one, one thing that can help guys out, you know, one really quick tip is if you're in a, in a body of water that has a ton of grass and it all looks the same, well, it's not, you need to find something different. Don't even make a cast find something different in that area. If it's a area that gets sparser, if it's an area that has deeper water hitting the grass, if it's, you know, an area where multiple grass, you know, different kinds of grass come together, something different. Start, it's always, it's going to help, you know, the fish learn, you know, their, their, their area yeah. and they're going to use something to their advantage in that grass. Cool. That's good to know. So uh, real quick before we get into our closing segment, uh, offline I had mentioned to you that we haven't really gotten into some of these stories that folks like yourself have been in the industry for a while have like, seen. Uh, and I'm just, like, we, were, we were talking about rough water, so we never got to ask you that and hear your answer. So like, what is like some of the roughest water you've experienced while fishing professionally? So roughest I've ever been in was uh, Lake Champlain, you know, in a tournament. Uh, I made a long trip down to Ty, Ty kind of rode on the bottom end of the lake, and, you know, it was just one of those days where they, they didn't quite get the forecast right. You know, that doesn't happen a lot. They're usually dead on with the forecast, but this was one of them days they didn't, and the wind was a lot higher than, than they predicted. And, of course, we're catching fish up to the last second, and we push it to the last second, and we got out on the main lake, and it was, unfortunately, mountains of waves. And it's one of those deals, man. It's like if you don't make it back on time, you're going to lose your fish, your weight. And it was some of the roughest stuff I've ever been in, uh, to be honest with you, you know, Depth finders laying in, in the bottom of the boat, trolling motor bolts breaking off. And it's it's unfortunate because it could have been avoided, you know, if I if I had looked at the forecast a little bit, you know, maybe that morning instead of the night before, and I would have set aside some extra time, but I made it back. But the service trailer at the tournament was not too happy to see me. I mean boat my boat was destroyed. And uh, I've heard worse stories, to be honest with you, than that, you know, from guys over the years. I've, I've heard of guys that, uh, you know, weren't, weren't able to make it back, you know, filling their boat up with water from this run down the tide, filling their boat up with water. Their bilge pumps can't keep up. You know, guys got water almost up to their, their bottom of their seats, you know, and, and that you start to get in, that's dangerous. You know, so 
The worst stories I've ever heard of, though, when we were talking about this earlier, is all related to Lake Erie. <laughs> I, I've never fished a tournament there, but I've heard some severe, you know, horror stories of rough water there, guys. And I salute you for running around them lakes, man, for sure. It can be. Um... It could be a humbling, terrifying experience <laughs> that you um, you have to respect the lake and pray that she doesn't get angry with you while you're on it. <laughs> so, yeah, there's I mean, I've been out there where at six in the morning it is glass and by noon you have six footers. So and just out of the blue, nowhere, 20 mile an hour winds, thunderstorm comes through and it doesn't settle down. So it's like we called for sun and no wind, no rain today, and all of a sudden I have a thunderstorm. It's like, what is yeah. going on? And then you're 35 miles from the ramp and six footers. So that's funny. It's Lake Erie. They, we actually <laughs> have um, our meteorologists here have talked about it on the news a few times. We're like our own little weather bubble in Buffalo. Whatever they say is going to happen usually doesn't happen, and it's either way worse or way less than predicted. So if it's a 100% chance of rain in Buffalo, it's probably 10%. And if it's a 10% chance, you're probably at 100 Because for whatever reason, storms, when they're supposed to come through, die. And when you're not supposed to have storms, they pop up. So yeah. it's, you're, um, you're taking a chance every time. <laughs> It's like a Florida where you see bright, sunny skies, and then you're going to have like a 30-minute thunderstorm four times throughout the day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Typical summer average day. <laughs> yep. So before our, our last question for you, Brian, we have a question here from one of the viewers. Uh, it's one of our avid fans here. He asked, what's the cleanest fast food chain you found while traveling the country? Woo! <laughs> cracker, barrel, cracker Barrel count. I What's mean, that? Cracker Barrel. That, cracker I, barrel. I, I mean, kind I, of. I allow it. I allow it. <laughs> it's like the fast food of fine dining. I could count it. You can't go wrong with a Cracker Barrel. Chick Fil A. Chick Fil A. That's a good one. Chick Fil A. Yeah, but every time you pull in, there's like a 45 minute wait, no matter which one you go to. <laughs> Cracker Barrel is more fast food than Chick fil A. <laughs> Most sit down restaurants are more fast food than Chick fil A freaking drive through range. <laughs> we have two of them in Buffalo, and every time I drive by them, the line is like, down the street, I'm waiting for the cops to come and direct traffic because they're back up four different ways. It's comical. Yep, that's fun. Well, Brian, our last question for you here, and it's something that we like to ask everybody who's new to the show, um, and that is if you could sit down and invite three different people while they're past or present, they don't have to be fishing industry, to sit down, have a beer, have a steak, and pick their brain, who would you invite? Wow. And, and alive or, or not? They, right. they can be past. They can be 400 years ago if you wanted to. Wow. Um, I, I would say, can, can you see? Oh. oh, you cut out there a little bit. There you go. Good. Yep. yep. Um, believe it or not, I, I would like to talk to uh, Michael Jordan, you know, a good uh, for a number of reasons, you know, Michael Jordan, for sure. I, I would love to sit down with Kevin Van Dam. Uh, last one. And man, this is, this is tough. Like, I'm sure later on something will hit me. I'll be like, I wish I would have said that. But, That's uh, a very common response from a lot of people. We'll get a, a message in the over Instagram. And they say, "Man, I should have said this guy or who, whomever." And it's uh, it's always funny to hear those answers afterwards. Too. How about like my great great grandfather that I never met that built the cabin in Canada just to try to 
talk about how hard that might have been way back then, you know? I like that one. I'm sure there'd be some good good stories that come out of that. Yeah, you can hear all the stories about your grandfather and your dad that they'll never tell you or admit to, but he'll tell you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Get you some uh, some ammunition for family parties when they're teasing you. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Well, that's awesome, Brian. Do you have anything uh, you'd like to uh, share with anybody uh, before we sign off here? No, man. I, I appreciate everybody uh, related to you know this whole fishing world, man. So you know, guys listening and stuff like that. You know. Fishing is a really cool deal. Support anything you can related to the fishing industry, man. It's a, it's a small world. You know, you're gonna run into people that you know, you know, you might have met ten years ago. You're gonna run into them again some somewhere somewhere down the road. And uh, you know, thank you for everybody, and you know, thank you guys for having me. And guys, follow me on you know my social media. I'm I'm trying to get better with that. You know, I kind of keep up with it throughout the year, all my tournaments and. You know, sometimes I do post tournament recaps and stuff like that. So, you know, that's it, man. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, Thank of you. course. Yeah. Uh, I know Andy reached out to you and, and got you on here. We appreciate you for coming on. Uh, down in the description, if anybody's listening or watching, you can uh, click on the link down below and go follow Brian on Instagram. Uh, just a quick way to, to access that. But, Brian, thank you. We appreciate you taking the time out and. Good luck to you on uh, the fall swing, and good luck with your, your charter service as well. I hope that keeps going well for you, and things keep moving smooth, and you, you land some more of those fish you found and have a, a good rest of the season. I appreciate it, guys. You know, and good luck to all your fishing coming up, and you better get 30 pounds a day in your tournament up there, man. Yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be fun. So, uh <laughs> My uh, good friend Jeff and a local hammer here, Brad, both local hammers, they're probably the favorites to win it. But uh got some tricks up my sleeve with my there partner. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you'll know uh, Andy's partner. He's uh, one of your fellow competitors on the Olympic Series. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Destin Demarion, if he's listening tonight. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so that'll be fun. And then Bailey is fishing with – one of our other friends that goes with it. So it's going to be fun. A lot of trash talking. Yeah. <laughs> like, it. like it a lot, man. So it'll be fun. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully we can get you back on after the season is over and see how the last four tournament swing went for you. I appreciate you, my friend. Definitely holler at me if you need anything. And thank you again. Of course, Brian. You have a good night. See you guys. Yeah, yeah Brian. We appreciate it. I right, dude, that was that was a black. I hope he goes up to. De I should send him a message right now and be like, "If you see Destin, tell him Bailey says he's gonna crush you at Lake Erie." <laughs> <laughs> it would be amazing. That would be that would be hilarious. But dude, that was good. That was awesome. It was kind of cool to learn about the Potomac and stuff because yeah. like I've heard about you know and seen on social media the fisheries for Potomac and the Chesapeake, but I've obviously never really looked into it. So it's always been kind of like a mystery to me, but. Yeah, the only the only tidal fishery I think we have in New York is the Hudson. Really? And yeah, it's like six hours for me, so why would I ever go to yeah, the Hudson? And he's kind of a, a tidal fish. Which one? No. The Genesee River? No. You don't think like Ontario. I mean there might be tide, but it won't be anything like the Hudson because the Hudson right. can't Okay, I'm right. using current with tidal, so that's well, yeah, they're, they're hand in hand because you're going to have current in, current out with the title as opposed to the Great Lakes do have tidal swings, but they're like maybe inches compared to feet. Yeah. So. Very true. Well, dude, what do you got coming up this weekend or next weekend, tournament-wise? I have Honey Oid this weekend, and then the weekend after that is the Lower Niagara. That should be a fun one. Yeah, you got Shamo Saturday. El Jefe. Yeah. El Jefe with the juice. Head up to Shema on Thursday, get some practice in. Hoping the weather stays as is. Good old Lake Ontario, you're never going to know, but that's going to be a blast. It's probably going to be another smash fest, hopefully. Some big old smallies in the boat. and uh, we'll Team Derby, goes. falling temps. I bet it takes 28 to 30. 
<laughs> that's bold. <laughs> that's very bold. I, I'm sure there's some guys that are competing it that could do it, but Dude, that Lake Ontario, that end of Lake Ontario has so many six pound smallies. So I look, I look, Paul, look at Paul yeah. Mueller. He caught one that was almost eight pounds in what July? Yeah. Like there, there is a state record fish in that part of the state. Oh, I mean, yeah. it, it's especially eight pounds, four ounces. September, if the wind is right, it could easily be done. Yeah, no doubt. That's going to be a fun one. And after that, I don't have anything until uh, good old Douglas Derby on Erie. Yeah. Um, me and Mike are going to smoke you guys. I hope you do. We're going to go for largemouth. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, if, <laughs> if the lake blows up, it might not be a bad move if you can find them. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what it comes to. I mean, there's, there's no knowing a month away what it's going to be like. We won't know what it's going to be like till a day and a half before the derby. Honestly. We won't know until the morning of. He didn't. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> true. So I, I actually do have to reach out to Kyle because I need to figure out his plans for if the lake is blown off. And we're, I gave him the idea of where we could launch in the river. But that's about it. Yeah. And, and I had to buy a new prop for my boat. So hopefully I can find one for a good price before all of that goes down because I have a big old uh, ding in my prop from this weekend. Yeah, you made an oopsie. Oopsies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that was a quick seven hundred dollar oopsie. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. See, that's the nice thing about kayaks. You don't have a seven hundred dollar oopsie unless you sink your kayak. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So man. Yeah, man. This weekend we can talk about it a little bit, but this weekend yesterday sucked. Hey Yuga, how how was practice leading up to it? Practice was great. We were around fish. Uh, kind of put it bluntly, we I we caught a lot more fish in practice than we did in the tournament. Obviously, you know it was a co angler deal in boater, so my link did well. He did he did decent. He you know he was around the fish. It was kind of a struggle because the conditions like the fish just weren't active. They weren't chewing. Uh, at least not for the kind of class of fish that he was around. They were that bite that he wanted. He needed different conditions for it. Um, so he didn't do as well as, you know, well, the potential was there. Um, but our buddy Casey Smith won, destroyed everybody, uh, had 16 pounds for a four fish limit. So he took at home, took away, uh, took on, uh, he took first for angler of the year too, which I, I think he posted about it was his first AOI out of any circuit, which, you know, it's big for him. So congrats. That's awesome. To him. Congrats to him. Yeah. And I got 10th place overall at Cayuga with one fish for two and a half pounds. Dude, I thought I was going to get smoked by everybody. I thought my chances at the top nine for the state team were done. I get in there and people are like, yeah, I didn't catch anything. Caught nothing, caught nothing, caught one pounder. Nope. No, I got 10th place with a, a two and a half pounder, which is wild for that lake. It's known for its abundance of fish in many areas. I, I was actually talking to a, a friend of mine about that tournament yesterday and i noticed a similar trend last year once like late august september hit weights just dropped right off and like kiyuga went from superior awesome fishing to like you know two weeks time just they stopped eating people were i think one tournament last year in like september it took like 14 pounds for a team trail to win like that's how bad the bike got in the fall there well, so. I, I think, and I can be entirely wrong here, but you know, in in my drive home, I'm I'm sit, I'm trying to kind of formulate, like I know what certain guys are doing that worked well, but I was kind of trying to think about why it was such a struggle for a lot of people, and I think you know there's certain areas where the fish weren't biting, and I think conditions played a big part in that, and that's why people kind of struggled. But I also think with this fall swing, with this. I don't know if it's a bait issue because if it's a bait issue, then I think what's happening is, you know, you're going to find what bait is there and you're going to find a, a bigger number of fish that are chasing that bait. I think that's why that these fish are so clumped together in small tight areas. I think that could be what's going on that, but other than that, my only theory is just that it's getting pressured to a, an enormous amount 
or something about these conditions have them completely thrown off. I, I don't know, but I, I like to think the theory of that, you know, there's something with the bait that these, these bass are kind of clumping up in bigger numbers. So when you do find them, you find a good amount of them uh, rather than it's just a bite issue, but it is. I, and it very well could have been a bite issue too. Cause look at the wicked cold front that came through this weekend. But you think like, cause it wasn't, it didn't really come through this weekend. I mean, it did. But it, it was a cold week, too. It wasn't like it was, you know, 90s and 80s like we had a couple of weeks ago. I mean, yeah. last weekend, that it was same temperature. So it, it gave it time to stabilize. Yeah, get that, to that colder. I mean, the water temps, dude, were 60 degrees. Yeah. They should be true in they my should, mind. I don't know. They should be. But I, I've i always found, like, that first major cold front of the year, like, if even if it's a week long, you – you catch them really good right at the beginning when the temperature drops, and then as that temp just plummets like six, seven, eight degrees, they really shut off, and then it has to stabilize. It takes like two, three weeks for it to get good, and then there's a certain degree marker once you get below 60 where it just takes off again. Like I think that 60 to 65-degree water almost puts them in like this weird shock to where they won't eat. And they had all of a sudden the water temple hit a certain degree and it's like a light switch. Then they just chew. Like Lake Erie, we go through it every fall. Right now, Lake Erie is fishing just like Cayuga. You're going out struggling for five bites a day. Five, forget five good bites. You're struggling for five bites right now. Lake Erie is fishing so tough because the water temp is just plummeting so fast. And these fish are out deep and they're basically going through a shock syndrome. It takes. Every year from, like, the s- second or third week of September till about the 15th of October, I try to avoid Erie because you, it's so tough. Here's a question for you. So with Erie, you know, in the summer months, those fish move deeper, right, because they want colder water. So with these colder temps, do you think it's harder to find them because – of what you said, like a shock syndrome, or do you think it's harder because these temperatures are dropping, causing them to move around more? I actually, I have a couple different theories with deep water smallmouth. The first one is in the summertime, our temperature is taken 30 feet down at the roundhouse Buffalo water intake plant. It's taken 30 feet down and it's 74, 75 degrees all summer after like, the first or second week of July. That's a good question for us. Ask my parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you, got, you got to watch the podcast to know what that question was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, gosh, that's funny. But yeah, the water temp is taken 30 feet down. So, if you go to 40 foot, how much different is it really from 30 to 40 foot? Maybe two degrees. I don't think you're seeing 60 degree water temps 40 foot down. I think I think the surface temp and the bottom temp are relatively similar. And, and the reason why I say that is because we have dropped cameras down in 45 foot of water and the water temp 72 on the bottom. Interesting. That so, was going to be my next question too. I don't, I don't think water temp really affects them all that much i think it's when we get big winds in the fall there's upwelling so when we have cold water about 150 miles probably like 70 miles from us in buffalo where it's like 100 150 200 foot deep so on certain winds it'll cause an upwelling and the fish will move then okay um so basically all it does is displace water, pushes cold water up shallow, and the warm water goes out deep. And then you get all this weird stuff that goes on. And typically that happens right about now. So all the fish will technically move. And then once they move and you find them, you can really thump on them. But it's finding them is the hard part. And then... Once the upwelling disperses and everything kind of settles down, the water temp usually drops like five degrees, six degrees. And then once that cold water disperses, the bike gets wicked tough for like three weeks because those fish are just weird. And then towards the end of October, light switch goes on and you just 
pound the crap out of them until there's ice on the lake. Because hmm. they, I think that first initial cold water shock really messes with those fish. Even on the Finger Lakes, I've seen it on like Canisius Honey Eye. You can go there one day and the water temp's 70 and you're pounding them. And then you'll get that wicked cold front and they shut off for two weeks. Yeah. And then they slowly pick back up and then come. Next thing you know, it's middle, pardon me, middle of October and the bite is just insane. Yeah. And that could also be the fact that 99% of the anglers are now in deer stands. And the 1% that are dumb enough to go out with it snowing in the morning and raining in the afternoon and catching some green and brown fish, they can really make hay. I'm looking forward to that. You'll be hunting. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to hunt as much as you think I'm going to hunt. We will see. Uh, I think I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to leave it to like one or two days a week and then try to fish the other ones. Good. We'll see. see. We'll see how it goes. I don't even know the schedule. I don't. I don't know what I'm doing with my life yet because uh, we're still jobless. Unfortunately, we're letting the the market's wild, but we're making do with what we got ourselves. So it's pretty exciting to see. We got some ed, ed, endeavors. If I can speak, Mark, you can know it's the end of the podcast when I'm already starting to. You need water. I do, <laughs> but I have some endeavors that I'm looking forward to uh, embarking on soon. So. Looking forward to that, but uh, dude, I'm pumped. Made state team, co angler. Looking Heck forward. Yeah, to that. first well, year as a co angler, going from I'm not going to fish any tournaments this summer to fishing as many as possible, making state <laughs> teams, placing like top five in a fed tournament, like killing it, man. You're you're killing it. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to. The biggest thing I'm looking forward to is the national championship in March down in Texas. Heck yeah. Be a blast. That's awesome. Looking forward to wherever the heck they're going to have this regional. I hope they put it on like a pond just to mess with you. So you can't get any GPS thing. You can't look at Navionics. You just have to go fish. That'd be cool. I'm fine with that, dude. Because like when it comes to like Navionics and everything, it's, it ain't up to me. It's true. So either way, no matter where I am, I got to just go fish. So. Well, cool, dude. Good show today. Yeah. Uh, again, huge shout out and big thank you to Morgan Marine and Team Hobie. Looking forward to working with you guys. I'll make sure Andy snags the kayak every now and then. I don't think you're ever going to snag the kayak. <laughs> yeah, you're taking my boat. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Andy and I will do like a little video here and there. We'll, we'll swap. I'll take the Triton and you take the kayak. Yeah, I'll probably die. I am the most clumsy, <laughs> uncoordinated person in the world. So, I, like, hey, if you're hey, fishing on the kayak, you're fine. Why? You're a pro angler, you'll be fine. Yeah, probably. I am pretty wide, though, so my uh, my equilibrium balance is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be good now, Hobie. You'll be all right. But, uh, again, thank you to everybody for tuning in tonight. Uh, I definitely appreciate all the support. Uh, head down the links below if you guys would like to follow us on other social medias. If you'd like to get some serious angler merchandise and also to check out the amazing companies that are supporting us uh, next podcast. I'll have a bunch of the links and information for Morgan Marine. If you guys are in New York and you have any needs for your kayak or boat, definitely check them out, reach out to them if you're in the area and they will help you out without a doubt. Great service over there. So looking forward to tomorrow to go grab my kayak, but uh, we'll, we'll get some updates. We'll put it on the serious angler Instagram. Um, one other thing that we haven't mentioned in a while is if you, anyone's listening on podcast apps, head down. If you're able to leave a rating, leave us a rating, see how we're doing. Uh, throw a comment in there. Tell us we're ugly. I don't care what it is, but let us, <laughs> let us know how we're doing. Uh, we definitely appreciate you guys' support and tuning in. So Absolutely. Yeah, with, with that, Andy, you got anything else before we sign off tonight? I just want to say thank you to all the viewers. You guys are what – thrive us to keep bringing on the best that we can. And um, we basically do this for you so we can teach you some tricks and learn as well. So yeah. always ask questions, always tell us how we're doing. And um, you can even private message me on the side or Bailey, I'm sure. And with any input you have on how we can grow and get better, we we're all ears. So Definitely. help us out and we'll help you by giving you the information you're asking for. So 
And a uh, big shout out to our nightly viewers, Forrest and Zach, who like to talk to each other in the comments. <laughs> so thank you guys again for watching and listening. We will see you guys on Wednesday.